if I was, if somebody was to ask me what I do, that's what I do. I get your eyes level and the center of your weight over the center of your feet. That is the purpose of what we do, but it affects everything neurologically. Um, you know, and you can get very, you can get as complicated as you want because it's the most complicated machine that has ever been invented. From Fiori Communications, it's How I Got Here, a show of inspiring stories from Tallahassee area leaders, business owners, and neighbors, all the challenges, opportunities, inspirations, the twists and turns of life that led them to where they are today. Everyone has a story worth telling, and I am really grateful that we get to bring a few of them to you. I truly have been changed by my conversations with these amazing people, and I'm confident you will be too. I'm Dave Fiore, and on this episode, I speak with Dr. Dennis Fiorini of Fiorini Chiropractic Center, a practice he founded with his wife, Kim, in 1992. Dennis grew up in Detroit, the youngest of five children, and learned to love sports and music, playing the trumpet and jazz bands with dreams of studying music in college. All that changed when he was injured in a car accident and received care from a chiropractor to help with severe neck pain. He finished high school with a flurry of science classes, got his prerequisites from a nearby university, and then headed to Georgia for chiropractic school. While there, he received an adjustment from a fellow student for a headache that did not go well, and that led him to the door of the man who would change his life. More than 30 years later, Dr. Fiorini is helping people with the same treatment he received that day and built his professional life around. The year he graduated, he also met and married Kim, also a chiropractor, and they soon settled in Tallahassee with the idea that it was a place they could be successful professionally and would enjoy living for the rest of their lives. He and Kim have raised three children here and seem to have made the adjustment pretty well. Dennis did not give up on his musical dreams, however, as he taught himself to play guitar and had quite a run performing Garth Brooks music, complete with the trademark shirts and big hat at local events and festivals. We started the conversation by talking about what is most important to him. Personally, it is, it's all about my family and making sure that they uh, are equipped to go through life. If something was to happen to me, that they can go on and do what they need to do and make something, do something for humanity that makes a difference, whether it's for one person or whether it's for a group of people. At the end, I want to, it's kind of like if, if you look back and you go, okay, did I make a difference in anybody's life? I've got a great uh, friend who we just lost, Dr. Roy Sweat. And um, when I think about the impact that he had, not only on people that he was involved with, with us, with his family, but the fact that what he did in his 94 and a half years of life is going to impact people in a hundred years. So that's kind of, uh, makes me feel a little bit small mm-hmm. because I, I, I look back and I go, okay, it is what I'm doing today going to be relevant in a hundred years. Mm. And so that's, that's my number one thing that I'm constantly thinking about that I'm constantly, uh, worried about if you, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just one of those things that for some reason that got permeated into my brain and I'm like, okay, so what am I doing right now? That's going to impact people in a hundred years. Mm. So you grew up in a suburb of Detroit in right. the late 60s and 70s. Right. Um, so what was that like growing up in the Motor City <laughs> or near it? Well, you know, whenever I mention that, that, I'm, that I grew up in Detroit, people are always like, well, aren't you glad you're out of there? And frankly, I've been in the South longer than I was in the North because I was only there until 
1984. So I was 20 years old when I left. So 38 years in the South, I, I moved to Atlanta in, in 80, at the end of 84. So, you know, everybody's like, aren't you glad you got out of there? And I go back and it's still home. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going to Detroit Tiger baseball games at the old Tiger Stadium at Michigan and Trumbull, um, where as long as you were in the stadium, you're okay. But if you started wandering out of the stadium and in those neighborhoods around there, it was a neighborhood called Corktown. And Corktown was kind of known, was, was, was kind of notorious. That was where kind of where all the crime was, right? But here's this iconic 1880 or something like that is when the stadium was built. And you're inside in the wood uh, uh, seats and everything, and you're watching the Detroit Tigers. You're watching Mark the Bird Fidrich on on the uh, on the mound, grooming the mound and talking to the ball and all of that stuff. And it was just it was fantastic. But uh, I I had a little area in the city of Warren, Michigan, which was uh, and if you've ever been to Detroit and that part of Michigan, it's all laid out in one mile squares. It's all platted out like that. So we lived between 12 and 13 mile road and Hoover and Van Dyke. And basically all my schools were there, my, my elementary, my junior high, my high school, they were all within that one mm-hmm. square mile road. Uh, all my friends were within that one square mile road. We'd, you know, go across the street and you know, mom would say, you know, come back when the street lights come on, you come back home. Right. And you basically you did whatever you wanted until the street lights came on. When sure. the street lights came on, you went back home and you had dinner and you had your little nuclear family there and uh, and had a great time. So growing up in Detroit was fantastic. There was lots of music. Uh, I was really involved in music from uh, when I was in elementary school through high school very involved in music. I wanted to be a jazz trumpet player. So you were in the band? Oh, yeah. Uh, we And in high school, we were in a uh, jazz band. Mm-hmm. And the high school jazz band would play at all sorts of different venues all over um, Macomb County is where we were at. And we play at... Uh, malls on the weekends and it was a hot band man we were yeah. we were good and in fact uh one time <laughs> one time i i had I, I didn't like american history and i didn't like the teacher um because he was kind of hard and everything yeah. and looking back he probably was one of our best teachers but uh i skipped his class a lot but i would skip it with the band teacher <laughs> so the band teacher and a couple of us would go to breakfast during this hour, second hour or something like that of high school. So the band teacher knew you were skipping class? I'm not sure if he – I'm pretty sure he didn't know that we were skipping. I think he just kind of thought we were – You had a spare had hour a study, in the morning. We had a study hour at that time or something like that. Right. You know, looking – when I'm looking back at it, I'm like – yeah, why did he let us do that? But that's what I wanted to do when I was in high school. Okay, is be a is be a musician. I wanted to go to uh, either Eastman School of Music or Berkeley in Boston, and uh, that's what I wanted to do because Chuck Mangione, he was my yeah. god at that time, right? Yeah, I and, used to, I used to play the drums to his records and get very discouraged. It's well, yeah, it's he, tough. Yeah, but his drum his drummers were yeah. amazing, yeah. and I'd go see him all the time. But that's what I wanted to do mm-hmm. until one day my dad said, "You know, there's already a Chuck Mangione," and I was and it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, "Oh no, that's exactly right." You know, I gotta make my own way in right. this world, and. Um, so that was when I started second guessing what I wanted to do uh, because one of the things that he told me, he said, you know, you might get to be the best one day, but there's always, if you're the best, there's always somebody trying to knock you off of that pedestal. Mm-hmm. And somebody always does. It wasn't that somebody is going to try, somebody always does, and then you got to do something to get back up on the top. Right. There. 
All right, I want, I want to come back to your college decisions and what you did after high school. But first, tell sure. me a little bit about your family, your parents. Do you have any siblings? What was family like, life like for you growing up? So I grew up in, uh, uh, I was the youngest of five. Um, my mom and dad uh, were married in like 1950 mm-hmm. um, and uh, had five kids. I was born uh, almost exactly a month after the Beatles came mm-hmm. to the United States. Right. So uh, I, I was, I'm four years younger than my next oldest sibling. Okay. So I had three sisters. My oldest sister, Diane, she uh, was uh, like uh, 10 or 11 years older than me. And then uh, I had uh, Lisa and Sue and uh, my brother, Joe. And uh, growing up, there between 12 and 13 in Hoover and Van Dyke. Um, in your little in, world, in our, right? In our, in our little world, uh, I, it, I had a great life because I was the youngest. Hmm. And so dad would uh, go off to work. He, uh, he started out selling sewing machines door to door, putting loss leaders in the paper, uh, you know, fully functional sewing machine, nine ninety nine or something like that. I think is what the actual price was. And then he'd get those leads, and he'd go in Detroit, and he'd um, knock on the doors and bring them the sewing machine, and then try and sell them up to the twenty nine ninety nine one. Right. And the thing about Dad was, he was a consummate salesman, but he believed that those people needed that twenty nine ninety nine sewing machine. He was, and when they didn't, he would get all, he would go back to his car and he'd go, okay, what, what do I got to do to get them to buy this? And one of his protégés said, maybe they just don't have the money. <laughs> <laughs> that might be it. Right. And, uh. He may not have had anything to do with him or his pitch or Exactly. Anything, right? And my dad was always like, no, that's not it. But anyways, he turned that into, uh, I think 15 appliance stores, Wow. Uh, in Michigan and in uh, Canada, because everybody knows Detroit is just north of Canada. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. He had to go south to get to Canada. Right. Um, but anyway, so he did that. Mom was pretty much at home most of the time until I got into like junior high. And she, then she started being a bank teller or something like that. Uh, the other kids... Um, Diane, uh, I mean, they basically raised me, my three sisters, uh, primarily my, my second oldest sister and, my, and the youngest sister. They primarily raised me. And, re- and I would have to say that the youngest sister and I were really the closest because I was the youngest son. She was the youngest daughter. And whenever anybody, you know, when they went out of town or something like that, she watched me and all of that. Yeah. Back to your high school years, you're <laughs> – you- you're kind of sh- shifting after your conversation with your dad, you're kind of shifting your thoughts on what the future may hold. And you're thinking you may not, your pursuit may not to be a, a jazz musician. Right, Is that right? Right. Right. So, uh, I was at a, a Tigers baseball game, uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And this was, I think 10th grade or something like that. And, uh, we had she had borrowed her mom's car for us to go to the baseball game. Her mom didn't know it. Um, it was brand new. It was a. I remember it like so. It was it was borrowed yesterday. the right word. She, she kind of stole it, uh, <laughs> but it was a brand new Nissan Sentra. Mm. And and so work. This is class, right? So we go down to the to the ball game. We go see the ball game. We're on the on I ninety four. Uh, going back home that evening, bumper to bumper traffic. This is back when people still lived in Detroit. Okay, right. Um, it, I think it was the fourth largest city at the time, and uh, we're at bumper bumper traffic, and we get hit uh, from the rear by a. I forget what year it was, but it was one of those Grand Prix that had like a ramrod front. Mm. You know, it kind of looked like the Mach 5 from Speed Racer or something like that. But it had that ramrod kind of pointy front. And, uh, yeah, we get hit, whipped up pretty good. And uh, we got out of the car, and they're pouring beers out of of their car, right? And so we're standing there, and it's pretty bad damage. Brand new Nissan Sentra that we borrowed, right? So they take off. So we're standing there, we wait for the police, and all of a sudden, my neck starts bothering me. My girlfriend's 
sisters, two of her sisters, uh, were chiropractors. Mm. And one of them was one of them practiced in Georgia, but one of them was practicing in the Detroit area. And the next day, I couldn't even barely pull my head up off of the pillow. So um, she said, well, let's go see my sister. And so we went there and she took x-rays and all that stuff and started treating me. And I got quite a bit better. And so I was like, I talked to my dad. I said, I think I might want to be a chiropractor because this is really helping me. And he goes, were you familiar with chiropractors at all before that? I, before that, I had no idea. I had gone, well, I, I'll, I'll take that back. I had gone with with my girlfriend a couple of times to her chiropractor and, sh, and she got adjusted and everything. Um, but it was, I mean, old timey chiropractor, not like, what, not like what we do, not like what our office does today. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, so uh, he goes, okay, well, what do you got to do? He said, find out what you got to do, what your grades got to be like and all of that stuff. And, of course, grades got to be pretty good uh, to get into a school like that. It's like getting into medical school. It really is. And right. Most people don't understand that. But uh, So I started backing away from music a little bit. And so I started taking all the chemistries and the biologies and all that, taking, upping my sciences. Um, and then I went to Eastern Michigan University to get – uh, the prerequisites oh, okay. uh, to to uh, to go to Life University or Life College at the time. So when you went to Eastern Michigan, you knew that that was a stepping stone to get to Life College. Yes, absolutely. Right. Okay. Um, I knew exactly what classes I needed to take, okay. and I was going to take exactly those classes and no other classes, <laughs> uh, and just get what I needed. Right. So that's what got me uh, to. Uh, to Marietta, Georgia, then, in uh, in at the end of 1984. Um, so, how did that go? I mean, I know you wanted to be a chiropractor, and you had mm -hmm. that, you know, that seed had been planted. But when you got to school and you actually started studying it, how did you feel when you actually made it to the university? And did you take to it instantly? Did you just fall in love with it? How did how did that go at the beginning? I absolutely fell in love with it. Uh, I, I saw things that I never thought would, you know, would even be related to chiropractic care. Mm. Um, at the time, I, I, when I first went down there, I thought, you know, muscles, pain and stuff like that. But when I got there, I started to understand what it was really all about. And it was all about the nerve function. It was all about the relationship between the brain and the spinal cord and the rest of the body. And so I was getting turned on. It was fantastic because I saw things like, you know, people getting their hearing back and uh, their sight back hmm. and tremors that they they would be tremoring and then they'd get adjustment and the, and the tremoring would stop. Just mir miraculous type of things. And I was like, yeah, this is really, really great. Uh, and so I, I put my nose to the grindstone. I ended up uh, with one really good friend. I had a bunch of friends, but I had one really great friend. Uh, his name is Matt Sweat. You know, we went through it all together. Mm. But we did start doing research while we were in school. We were involved with the research department, and that even made me even more wanting to do this. So it wasn't just that I wanted to practice, but I wanted to do research. As so what well. were you researching? So the one, the, the one study in particular that we did involved epileptic and autistic children. Mm. And, uh, it was, it was, uh, epileptic children, they would have, uh, grand mal or petty mal type seizures, but we would do uh, electroencephalograms, brain uh, waves, right? And uh, before we adjusted them, and then we do it after we adjusted them, and we saw some really amazing things. One in particular: the only time that he would have a seizure is if he fell and hit his head, like or or whipped his neck around or something like that. And he would almost immediately have a seizure and we'd check him and he was out of alignment. We'd align him and then he wouldn't have another one until he had a trauma like that. Mm. So it, it was just absolutely 
uh, fascinating and amazing uh, that the type of work that we were doing with those kids, because we weren't doing just the normal, the normal or the typical manipulation. We were using an instrument to adjust them with real specific angles. Right. Um, and that's, that's what kind of turned me on to the whole thing. Right. Besides the fact that that technique helped me because I almost quit chiropractic school. Oh, why? Um, I was, it was, it was due to another girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I, I was dating this girl and I had this terrible headache and she wanted to go for lunch. And I said, you know, I think I'm just going to go home and rest. She goes, well, let me take you in the student clinic and adjust you. Now she was a couple of quarters ahead of me. Okay. Um, so she was in the student and the outpatient clinic. And so she takes me into the student clinic and uh, I lay down on my back and she takes my neck in her hands and she does a manipulation to the left and then to the right. Of course, it cracked. And like I've been seeing, miraculous, you know, headache gone. Right. Right. So So all's good at that point. So all's good at that point. And uh, so, uh, yeah, life is good. So I'm laying on the table and I go to get up. And I fall back on the table because of the dizziness, mm-hmm. vertigo. Um, and, of course, she goes, what's wrong? And I said, uh, I'm all of a sudden real dizzy. I said, the headache's gone, but I'm really dizzy. And she said, I didn't do that. And I, I said, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> so anyways, so I get up. We do go to lunch. And, uh, but that dizziness doesn't go away. And so it kind of eased up. And then the next day I got up and it was pretty bad again, getting a little bit worse and went and got adjusted again and didn't do anything. It, I mean, it didn't fix the dizziness. Let me put it that way. Um, so for eight weeks, this dizziness is getting worse and worse and worse. Wow. I was walking around the, the school, chiropractic school, uh, holding onto the walls to be able to walk. I got to the point where I couldn't drive. So Matt Sweat, my buddy, uh, he had an 80s model RX-7, and he'd come and pick me up from the, from the apartment and take me to school. And we'd sit in class, and we were all in the, all in the same classes and everything. Um, finally, he got tired of me needing him to come pick me up right. for, for school. And he said, you need to go see my dad. And I said, okay. Um, I said, I don't have any money. He goes, he'll want to help you and you'll work it out. He goes, but I can't come and pick you up anymore. So (laughs) (laughs) the friendship had reached its limit. It had reached its limit. So he puts me in the RX-7. We get in the RX-7. He's driving. I couldn't sit up in the car Mm. because I was so dizzy and I would get sick. Yeah. So my feet are in the front seat of this 80s model RX-7. My head is in the back and uh, it's, you know, it's a, sta- it's a, uh, a stick shift. So every time he'd shift, it'd hit my leg. Right. And I remember it's a it, small little sports car. It, yeah. Right. Uh, I, and I remember it was uh, quite vividly. So we get to Dr. Sweat's office. He was on the northeast side, I think, of, of Atlanta. And uh, he takes me over there, and, of course, Dr. Sweat comes in, and he examines me, uh, wants to find out what happened, you know, the consultation, the examination, all that stuff. Sends me into the other room to get x-rays. And these are this is back when x-ray, you didn't have a, even an automatic processor. It was hand-dip x-rays. Right. So <clears throat> I get the x-rays, and they put me in a room to wait. And I waited. And I waited and I waited. Dr. Sweat never took appointments. Finally, he comes in and uh, Dr. Sweat was, I mean, the energy in this guy was fantastic. He was my age, the age I am right now. Mm. When I met him, he was my age. Right. And I was like, God, he's old. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, so he comes in, he shows me the x-rays and everything. and, And he says, this is what we need to do. I think you have what's called a vertebral artery syndrome. Vertebral artery is the main blood supply to the brain stem and the back part of the brain. So balance coordination, that type of thing, plus everything else, by the way. Um, 
Anyways, he, he puts me on the Atlas Orthogonal Percussion Adjusting Instrument. It's a long, intimidating name. Yeah. And uh, he adjusts me. And uh, Dave, I, I've, I've, I had felt for eight weeks, I had felt like I had a veil over my face, mm. like it was cl- like everything was cloudy. That immediately went away. Immediately. I was still on the table laying down. As I sat up, that dizziness that I had and was getting worse for eight weeks was completely gone. Mm. Not just a little. I mean, it was gone. And I looked at Dr. Sweat and I looked at that instrument and I said, you know what, Dr. Sweat, I'll never give one of those manipulations. Never. Mm. Maybe that was kind of bold on my part because I was still in chiropractic college, <laughs> right. right? And uh, I didn't quite think it through. Uh, but I never have. I've never given one of those in a clinic, se- in so a clinic setting. you were all good with what was being taught mm-hmm. until you got that adjustment that messed you up. Right. And then you were ready. You're like, you were ready to quit. You're like, this is not working. I don't want to do this to other people. Yes, until exactly. You, until you met Dr. Sweat and he showed you a different way. Right. Right. And so he showed me that different way. And I said, I want to learn how to do this. And he said, I can teach you how to do this. And mm. so we would we started going to the weekend seminars and all of that and learning all of that from him. And now, I mean, fast forward 35 years later. Um, so what did you do to get your degree? I mean, you still had to kind of just go along with the other stuff to get your degree. Right. But because we were in, remember I told you we were in that research department. Right. Because we were in there, we had – uh, a doctor that was supervising us that could sign our slips. Mm-hmm. So we saw all of our patients in the research department, okay. which was really lucky or blessed, one of the two, right. or maybe a little of both, um, because we never had to give one of those. Now, we still had to set up and sh- in class. So you could everything. do it. But Matt and I were always partners. Right. And so... You know, we wouldn't do it as hard or anything like that. And and we got a little bit of a reputation because mm-hmm. and, they were kind of like, oh, you know, they're being snotty and everything. But it really wasn't anything about that. It was like, okay, if I get manipulated, I might go back into that same situation mm-hmm. and, and I'm not willing to do that because right. I thought I was going to die. Mm-hmm. Matt has a lot of the same type of symptoms when, of course, now he was, he never got one of those manipulations. But I mean, thank God. I mean, could it have been the, the doctor, the, the chiropractor that gave me the manipulation rather than the actual manipulation? Sure. Yeah. Cause I know a lot of people that do real good. Um, you just knew you didn't want to do that. I knew I didn't want to risk doing that, doing someone else having that feeling hmm. because I did something, and um, that was real prevalent in the back of my mind all the time. So I decided that I needed to learn this stuff and and be as good as Dr. Roy Sweat mm. or better. Right. And so that's what I set out to do, and that's what Matt and I both have set out to do throughout the years. Right. What an interesting path to, because it's really following a whole different philosophy yes. of care, right? Absolutely. It was, and it was definitely against the grain, you mm-hmm. know, because here we are, we're learning all this stuff. Now we did, we were kind of lucky because the president of the college, Dr. Sid Williams, who, who he uh, actually founded the college there in Marietta, he was an upper cervical doctor. So he adjusted the atlas, the Mm. upper part of the neck. He did a a, a different type of technique. It was called toggle and it was quite hard. That was about 40 to 50 pounds of force. Mm. And, but he loved us because he loved Dr. Sweat. All right. So you graduate from college in 1989. Yep. But more importantly, that's also the year that you married your wife, Kim. Right. Correct? Yes. So tell me, she hasn't been introduced in the story yet. So where does, okay. where do you meet her? How did that all happen? Yeah, we need to get her in. There. Yeah. So uh, um, Matt and I were great friends and we were going to go out on Valentine's Day. And he goes, he goes, you need to ask, you need to ask Kim. Her name was Atkinson at the time. Um, she said, you need to ask Kim to go to this Valentine's thing. It was at a 
a piano bar or something like that mm-hmm. in Atlanta. And I said, okay, great, I will. So I asked her. She never called me. <laughs> she never called me back. Let's put it that way. Right. And so I'm devastated. I'm like, ah, oh, geez. Okay, so I go to this piano bar with him. Uh, you know, with there a bunch of bunch of couples, uh, and there was a couple of single ladies, but it wasn't. There was not a connection or anything like that. So, anyways, later on, finally, I I I was I actually was dating somebody else, and then broke up with that girl. And finally, uh, I called over to uh, I called over to Kim. Oh no, she called me to see if I would come and help her with some X rays because mm-hmm. I was learning the AO work and she was trying to learn it too. And uh, I said, well, sure. Yeah, I'll come over and, and, uh, uh, help you with those x-rays. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm just watching a movie. I don't even, I think it, I can't even remember what the movie was. I'm just watching a movie. I worked at Blockbuster at the time. And, uh, I said, well, I'll bring this movie with, with me. And so we did. And, uh, and so we had a nice little evening and watching the movie and everything. I, I don't remember if we ate or whatever. And, uh, anyways, so then I asked her out on a date and finally she said, yeah, and we went to see dirty rotten scoundrels <laughs> and we started dating and that was in January of 89, um, February 9th of 1989. Uh, I asked her to marry me. Wow. February 9th. So how did you know that she was the one so quickly? I don't know the answer to that. I've often thought about it. But I don't know the answer to it. To, uh, it, it was just, it was a connection. And so we got married and um, that, that was the beginning of the 33 years of, of our time. We've literally been together like 33 years and a month. Right. Is how long we've been together. And you have three children. We got three children. Uh, Caitlin, who, by the way, was also born on February the 9th. She, yesterday was her 31st birthday. Um, Chase is, he was, he came along in 93. So two years later. Um, and then Emily came along in 1999. I lost my dad in 1998. Mm. Um, he was 60, 66 years old. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, so she comes along six years after our last one. Caitlin worked for Disney for about seven or eight years. And then when the pandemic hit, she, uh, you know, they laid her off. So she's been up here with us uh, for the last couple of years. She's now at our, really running our front desk at the office now and doing a great job. She's got all that Disney training, which is fantastic. Uh, Chase works for uh, Florida Virtual Campus. Um, he went to sound, uh, uh, a recording engineer school at Full Sail down in Orlando. Mm, yeah. And then Emily graduated with athletic training, uh, uh, a degree from FSU. And she starts in August at Belmont University for physical therapy. Oh, that's great. So she's, she wants to be a pediatric physical therapist. Uh, Kim uh, was a chiropractor, and uh, we were talking to Dr. Sweat one time. She's still a chiropractor. But we were talking to Dr. Sweat one time, and Dr. Sweat said, we said, uh, we're trying to open up a practice. I said, I'm looking at Tallahassee. I'm looking at Jacksonville. I'm looking at Orlando. I'm looking at Fort Myers. Uh, he, and uh, I was explaining, you know, her family is in Jacksonville. My family's down at Fort Myers. And, and he puts up his hand, and he said, Dennis, he said, you have to practice where you can practice for the rest of your life. He said, if you like the beach, practice near a beach. If you like the mountains, practice near a mountain. Mm -hmm. He said, if the practice fails, it's your fault. He said, if the kids grow up crazy, it's her fault. (laughs) And And it wasn't a male chauvinist kind of thing. Right. It was a, he knew that her passion was our fan, was the family. Mm. And cause that's what all she ever talked about. And he knew my passion was Atlas orthogonal. Right. And so it wasn't a chauvinistic thing. It was like, she's going to focus on that anyways. 
And I know you're going to focus on this. So in order to enable you to do what you need to do to care for the family, which is most important to her, you've got to practice where you can practice the rest of your life. And we came out with Tallahassee because I just felt like it was a great place to raise a family. And of course, now you can go anywhere on vacation. You can go to the mountains, you can go to the beach or whatever. And um, so that's how that all turned out. Did you like Tallahassee right away when you moved here? I did. Uh, you know, we looked at Jacksonville, but I, I felt like every time I went to Jacksonville, it, it smelled funny. Um, I was with a consultant at the time, and we did the demographics, and there was only one chiropractor for, I, I can't remember the exact demographics on it, but it was it was like nowhere else in Florida was the demographics as there were suitable. fewer here. There was fewer chiropractors mm-hmm. per population. Right. And so the consultant that I had, Dr. Pete Fernandez, who's the other chiropractic person that, you know, I owe the practice to, um, he said, I've not seen that in any city in Florida. He said, so we just need to find you a place. So to there's help. opportunity there. Yes. And so his whole, his whole thing was get us into, coach us into practice and get us, you know, having a, a viable business and and taking home a a, right. a paycheck well, at the end of the day. Well, tell me about that process because, you know, not everybody realizes that, you know, just because you, you know, you're, you're good at delivering chiropractic care mm-hmm. doesn't mean you're necessarily equipped to start and run a business. That's a sure. whole different skill set. So Absolutely. tell me, as you're, you know, you're just a couple years out of school, you're newly married, mm-hmm. you're moving to a new town, you're setting up, you know, Fiorini Chiropractic. Right. And you're trying to figure out every, it seems like you're trying to figure out everything all at once. So yeah. how did, how did you handle all that? So before I, uh, before I was actually licensed, you had to do an internship with a Florida licensed chiropractor. Okay. And so I went down to uh, uh, St. Pete and practiced with a guy named Dr. Charles Gardner, real nice fella. And he was an Atlas orthogonal doctor. And I worked with him for three or four months. And uh, I asked him, I said, how did you know how to open your practice? And he said, "Um, practice management associates, consulting firm, uh, Dr. Pete Fernandez. And literally, the PMA building was two or three miles from this clinic. So I went over there on a lunchtime one time. And I said, here's what I want to do. I want to sign up. And it was like $100 a month or something like that. And they taught you the basics. They taught you how to have a practice before you even opened your doors. So they helped us with a a business plan that you could take to the bank and all that stuff. And so I, I did all of that stuff. I'm still involved with him. I teach on his programs, and I'm still a client of his after over 30 years. Mm. So, well, this year will be 30 years. Um, but uh, so we, I, I learned all of that stuff uh, and how to do that. One of his procedures was before you went into practice, before you opened your doors, you had to meet 1,500 to 2,000 people. You had to meet them. And we had a procedure called new practice survey. And so I'd go up and knock on a door and, um, hi, I'm Dr. Dennis Fiorini. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a chiropractor here in town. I'm thinking about opening up a practice here. Can I ask you a few questions? And most of the time they said, yes, Mm -hmm. you know, and I had all these questions and sometimes they'd invite me in, you know, for lemonade or something like that. And that was always a no, no, you just didn't do that. Cause it not because you might get, you know, kidnapped or something like that, or, you know, had your throat slit, but because it just took too much time. Right. So the idea was meet as many people as you can within the, that first three months, touch as many people as you can and touch them three times. So you meet them, you send them a letter saying, thank you for your time. I'll let you know when, when, when I'm we ready open to up. open up. Right. And then when you open up, you send them another letter. So it was a, it's a great procedure. And I still tell people today that that's, I mean, that's why we're still alive here. I still get patients from that survey. Wow. Still. That's amazing. Not a lot. Right. But every once in a while, people will say, you know, you stopped by my door. 
you, you uh, well, I talked to you, you know, 30 years ago. Right. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Hey, everybody. Just a quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by Fiori Communications. Just like people, every business has a story to tell. And we've been helping our clients tell their story since 2001. Because who you are as a company is just as important as what you do. To learn more about how telling your story can make a difference in your business, visit FioriCommunications.com. Thanks again for listening. Now back to the show. And I know now also you're innovative and creative as far as marketing and promotion. You you seek a lot of different avenues to get your name out there and connect with the community. Mm-hmm. So is that is that a part of the business you enjoy doing? Yeah, I really love that. Uh, my uh, Our partner, Kim and my partner, her brother, uh, Mike Atkinson, um, he is more of the staying in the office and and you know just doing all of that stuff you know moving bones basically right um i am kind of the outward one i love doing what i do in that office but i also like getting information out to people i i tell people at this stage in my life i almost like teaching people as well as helping them get their atlas adjusted uh, I like teaching other doctors. I like teaching the public, mm-hmm. and that's what most of the stuff that I do on on you know whatever I do. If I'm if I'm doing a TV show or if I'm doing a radio show or if I'm doing something on Facebook or anything like that, it's always about getting the message out. And what how it works in my brain is I don't worry about. I don't worry about the bottom line Mm -hmm. about it. Now, you know, I've got a semblance of a budget on what to, and I know that in order to keep the practice going, you got to have a certain amount of that. And then to make it grow, you got to have a little bit more of that. But I never, at this point, 30 years in, I don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. I think about, okay, if, if I can educate people on what we do, and why we do it, um, I, I, and I can get that message across, then I think in, in the end, regardless, it's going to, quote unquote, pay off. Right. Whether, well, it's, whether it's doing, whether it's the practice growing and, you know, us making money and that type of thing, mm-hmm. which is necessary, but or getting the message of what I do across. I think it's more important to, than anything. There's 7.8 billion people on the planet. And every one of them, in my opinion, needs to have their atlas checked, their neck checked, to make sure that the, that's in alignment. And if it's not in alignment, they need to be adjusted. And almost everybody, we can get adjusted. Almost. There's, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously, there's other reasons. For instance, I had a guy come in and his atlas was broken. Mm. And so I'm not going to adjust him for a while. So you say at with, for, I don't know what the atlas is. What is, what is the atlas? So the atlas is the top bone in your, in your neck. It's the top bone in your spine. It's called C1. Mm -hmm. Um, The spinal cord starts maybe a half inch above the atlas inside of the skull. Um, the Atlas has nerves, uh, that go, that pass through it and that pass in front of it and behind it. It's got an artery that goes up into the brain, supplies the back part of your brain with blood. And if it's misaligned, it, it's actually connected to the spinal cord through what's called the dura mater. Okay. So it's the, it's the, uh, outer covering of the spinal cord Mm -hmm. it's connected so if it misaligns it can actually take the spinal cord with it but your brain always wants your eyes as level as they can be and the center of your weight over the center of your feet Mm. if i was if somebody was to ask me what i do that's what i do i get your eyes level and the center of your weight over the center of your feet that is the purpose of what we do but it affects everything neurologically, um, you know, and you can get very, you can get as complicated as you want because it's the most complicated machine that has ever been invented. All right. So switching gears here a little bit, talk about some other um, 
aspects of your life. You talked about being in a jazz band and playing trumpet mm-hmm. and enjoying all that. But I know you more of a as a guitar player and singer and especially a lover of the Beatles. Right. So so tell me <laughs> tell me how did you always play guitar or how did when did that come about? So I started playing the guitar. Um the the person that inspired me to play guitar was John Denver. Mm. And uh, I watched a, a John Denver show. Of course, this was back when he was huge. He was maybe the number one artist. Yeah. And uh, I got this uh, song book, and I f- nobody showed me it, but I figured out that the that they had little graphs above the bars of music that showed you how to finger the chords. Right. And so from this book, an evening with John Denver, a uh, song book, I started learning how to play the guitar. And um, just knocking it around, I, you know, right. I never took a I never took a real lesson or anything like that. So I would just play those things. You know, later on when I when I met Kim, started dating Kim because I was from Detroit, so it was all rock and roll. It was Bob Seger, Billy Joel was my favorite, Journey, Doobie Brothers. We we saw them all at a place called Pine Knob. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I meet Kim. No so, M&M yet. That was later. No M&M, but he, w- he grew up maybe about three miles from where I grew up. Right. Kim introduced me. She liked this. She, she put in this tape. She goes, oh, I want you to watch this concert with me. She puts in this tape, and it's this guy named George Strait. Very cowboy different. Hat, yeah. Cowboy hat, the jeans, the roper boots. Right. Big old guitar. The pressed Wrangler jeans. Pressed Wrangler, creased. Creased. Stacked. They called them stacked jeans, right? right? So this is is a real cowboy. So I was like, wow, this is pretty great. So I started listening to country music. Started listening to George Strait, Merle Haggard. I mean, I was was starting to listen to this stuff and I was like, this is pretty great. You know, Mm -hmm. this is not bad like everybody said. All my rock and roll friends were like, oh, yeah, country, Western music. And so I started really liking it and getting into it. And then, um, that again, 1989. 1989, this guy is introduced, and I hear this song, Much Too Young to Feel This Damn Old. And it's this guy named Garth Brooks. <laughs> and I'm like, he's pretty great. And I was... I was a little chunky at the time, and so I, I kind of people said, oh, "You look a little bit like Garth Brooks." That you know, and I, I don't think I do, but anyways. And so we go through all that. So I start learning his music, right? Um, and then over here at the fairgrounds, or there was some kind of talent contest down in Wakulla uh, County, and I played two of Garth Brooks songs, and I had the wild shirt and the cowboy hat on and everything, yeah. and people started. Going, oh, this guy's really well. Really you knew your cool. audience. That was the right, well, right, guy to right, play right, right. In Wakulla County, and then I started playing at uh, the fair every year. I'd do like a thirty-minute oh. show a couple times during the fair, and then a radio duo. And I can't remember exactly how this all came about, but it was Sue Jordan, yeah. and Vic Swan. Yeah, I remember that. WTNT yep. here in Tallahassee, and I would call in. And again, I don't remember, I think I called in to request a Garth Brooks song or something. So they started hearing about me and and Sue Jordan started calling me Dr. Garth. (laughs) And so that was my moniker. I became Dr. Garth. I had this other persona and I, you know, had all the shirts. I'd get shirts just like his. I'd get them from the same place he got them from. And I'd play the two background tracks and I'd play the guitar. And there's always a couple of songs I just played the guitar on and everything. And so that became a thing. Wow. Um, I did not know that. Yeah, that became a thing. And so we did end up having some shows where I had fog machines and lights and everything. (laughs) I used to do the Miss Wakulla pageant. And um, I was like the featured artist and everything, and wow. that that was my uh, my foray into impersonations uh, uh, of of Garth Brooks. And then when he retired, I retired. Wow, <laughs> that's too <laughs> s- so sad. <laughs> hey, we are in Sunrise Rotary Club together. Yes. So tell me why being a Rotarian is important to you. So it, it's it's just another way of giving back. So my, I've always been told that the best 
giving that you can do is giving where the person who you're giving to either doesn't know who you are or they have absolutely no way of repaying you. Mm. And Rotary is a great vehicle for that because you can pick whatever you want. For instance, my, my big thing is, is clean water. I think if, if the world, if we could get everybody in the world clean water, that would get rid of a lot of the wars. It would get mm-hmm. rid of, it would certainly get rid of a lot of the sickness because a lot of sickness is tied to dirty water. Yeah, for sure. Um, polio was the big one. Once we had sanitation and the salt vaccine, um, you know, polio has almost completely gone away. The wild polio virus. Now we still have polio and we have polio-like diseases. But right. um, but I, I think that, that that clean water is is great. And all of the different types of people that we that we come in contact in Rotary. Yeah. I've been in Rotary over 20 years. John Curry is who, who invited me. And um, it, it's been great. And so, I, you know, every Tuesday morning – since 1990-something, um, I'm meeting with the Rotary Club. All right. Looking back, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but it's how I end all the podcasts I want to ask you. Okay. Um, what is the one thing or person that changed or altered the trajectory of your life to this point? Okay. So uh, I would have to say it was Dr. Roy Sweat. Everything that I have today— is because he took an interest in me and taught me what I needed to know to help sick people get well. Mm. Um, Not only that, but just the wisdom that he attained in 72 years of practice. Because it was always, Dr. Sweat, this patient came in, they had this, 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 and this. He goes, oh yeah, I I had a patient just like that. Mm. And he told me exactly what to do. It wasn't just... And it wasn't just professional; uh, it was it was personal stuff, uh, and it was relationship stuff. After Roy, I'd have to say Kim. Kim uh, makes me she makes me a better person. It's it, it, and it's because she's worries all the time, <laughs> and um, and it drives me crazy, and she knows it drives me crazy, but. When she mentioned something, she goes, you know, you should look at that post that you made on Facebook. Maybe you should say it a different way or something like that. But she's like my little angel on my shoulder. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got this second set of eyes and this second She's got your back. Yes. And there's nobody that's got my back like she does. Mm. And uh, so Roy, and she knows that Roy was like a father to me, perhaps transcended even being a father to me. But, um, but she knows she's right up there. And uh, 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 it, we, uh, after 33, almost, well, like I said, we've been together for 33 years. Um, uh, I, I can't see, uh, she had, she was sick back in August. And, uh, there was a couple of nights that I thought she, I, I was going to lose her. I really thought I was going to lose her. She wasn't hospitalized or anything, but, but her oxygen was not good. And, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't see, I, I, I went in there and I said, you ain't leaving without me. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, try not to get too emotional. But yeah, that's, uh, no, that's sweet. That's, that's real yeah. important yeah. to let the people know. Yeah. All right. Final question. Yeah. This podcast is named How I Got Here. And we've talked about how you got to this point in your life. Mm-hmm. Where do you think here will be for you in three to five years from now? Three to five years from now, I, I probably will not be in the office as much. Now, Dr. Sweat gave me the example of 72 years in practice. Uh, so I don't see myself quitting practice. One of the things that, uh, that I see with, with his being gone... I'm teaching a lot more. I'm teaching the Atlas Orthogonal program to a lot more people, a lot more students, a lot more doctors. Uh, I'm also helping other doctors get into practice like Dr. Fernandez did for me and just teaching them how to handle these day-to-day things that that they need. So in three to five years, I'll be doing a lot more of that uh, as well as 
uh, teaching Atlas Orthogonal, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, because of uh, because of the pandemic, we we have all of this online stuff that we can do now. And so uh, I really look forward to being in, you know, uh, the Amalfi Coast teaching a seminar, you know, by Zoom or something like that, yep. if, if need be. So that's that's where I'd like to be. Um, of course, I'd like my, my family to be happy, successful, whatever that means to each one of them. And, uh, and having been married to Kim for almost 40 years at that point, so... That's, that's where I'm seeing uh, uh, where my life is going. I can't tell you how many times I get asked if I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> like, I was just at a furniture store a month ago, and I show her my credit card, and, oh, Fiore, you're the chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. I get that constantly. So you are obviously way more famous than I am because <laughs> everyone thinks I'm you. And I doubt if you ever get asked, oh, you're the marketing guy. I'm sure that has never happened to you. Actually, they asked me if I, no, I'm just no. kidding. <laughs> uh, I get, so, so your name is well, anything that starts with F-I-O-R in any way, well, you, you have done a good job of branding your name in this community. We, we've been around, like, you know, like I said, we've been around for 30 years. So sometimes it's just by accident. You know, that that happens. But Fiori means flowers, and uh, Fiorini means little flowers. Yeah, so I, I'm one up on you on that one. You're I, one I, up I'm on regular you. size flowers. I'm just little, but there's many of us. <laughs> so we'll overtake the big flowers. It always happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to the show. You can subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, please leave us a review. It really does make a difference. Thanks to my amazing staff at Fiori Communications who pick up the slack while I'm working on these podcasts and to Troy Bloom for composing our theme music. You can hear more of Troy's creations on Facebook and Instagram at Troy Bloom Music. To connect with the podcast or suggest a future guest, follow us on social media or email us at podcast at fioricommunications.com.